Welcome to the Retirement Made Easy podcast, a show created to be your go-to source for straightforward retirement advice. Best of all, it is presented in a language that you can understand. Are you ready for some straight talk on retirement planning without all the fluff? Well, you found the right podcast. Here's your host, certified financial planner, Greg Gonzalez. Let's jump into some listener questions. You can submit those at my website. Again, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. At the bottom, it'll say, ask Greg a question. The first question comes from Joe asking about the difference between an advisor who's a fiduciary like I am, and then an advisor who is not a fiduciary and how they operate. So there's a lot of different examples, and I love examples, but A fiduciary, the definition is it's an advisor or someone that has to do legally, morally, ethically what's in your best interest and puts that ahead of all things, all other things. And an advisor who's not a fiduciary, well, they operate under another standard. We call it the suitability standard. So what they recommend has to be suitable for you at that point in time. And think about the word suitable. What does that mean? Is it in your best interest or is it suitable? So here's an example that I love. Imagine you had high cholesterol and a doctor recommended Lipitor. Now, I don't know the price of Lipitor, but it is not a generic drug. It's a brand name drug. And it could be, let's say it's $300 a month. Now, if a fiduciary, if there was such thing as a fiduciary doctor, he or she might say, well, the generic does the exact same thing as Lipitor and it's gonna cost you about nine bucks a month. So I think the generic drug is in your best interest. Whereas Lipitor is actually suitable, but it's a lot more money per month. So I hope that example makes sense. Again, is it suitable or really in your best interest? Again, Joe, I am a fiduciary advisor. I wish all advisors were, but that's just the world we live in, I guess. But that was a great question, Joe. I appreciate you submitting that to the podcast. The next question is from Anne. Anne has a very quick question. It says, what should I expect to pay a CFP? The rep for my 403B, which is essentially it's a 401k for nonprofits like hospitals, school districts, that kind of thing. But Anne says the rep for my 403B now has his CFP credentials, which means certified financial planner. I do too, just like me, and has gone from charging me nothing for an annual meeting to a fee scale of $1,200 to $3,000. So Anne has a very good question here. She said this person went from charging me nothing to now all of a sudden after he got his CFP credentials, now he's charging $1,200 to $3,000. So I want to first start off by saying that CFPs, a certified financial planner, we can charge whatever we would like. Now, that doesn't mean you have to pay it as a client of his. I would expect that he would have a good reason why he increased his rates from charging nothing to $1,200 to $3,000. And my next question would be, what are you getting for that cost? Does your CFP, Certified Financial Planner, and do a lot of work on the front end before your meeting and constructing a personalized retirement action plan for you, giving you a tax analysis. So my question would be, what are you getting for that $1,200 to $3,000 to be able to say, okay, this is a good value for the money that I'm paying? He is, as the rep on the 403B, he's getting compensated through the 403B in some way, shape, or form, just like a rep on a 401K is getting paid through the 401K. So that's probably why he wasn't charging up until this point. I can give you a gauge, I guess. Some CFPs like myself charge between $100 to $200 an hour for the planning that we do. If someone hires us on a consulting basis, that's typically what we charge. Kind of like some law firms will charge you, I don't know, $200 an hour, $400 an hour for the work that they do. So it's very, very similar to that. But really, Ann, you've got to ask yourself, do I think I'm getting a good value for the the money that I'm paying? whether it's $1,200 or $3,000, if you're paying that much money for an hour meeting with somebody, I would hope that that person is doing a lot of planning for you and creating that retirement action plan. But if you're just paying somebody $1,200 to go meet with them for an hour and talk about the economy and Joe Biden and all this other stuff, in my opinion, that's not a good use of your money. So, and I hope that helps. The next question, it's a little 
confrontational, if you will, from a listener named Bob. And Bob seems a little upset from listening to a previous episode where I was talking about Wells Fargo and possibly Bank of America. I don't remember. And this is a long email from Bob, but basically he's saying that there are some good people that work at Wells Fargo and Bank of America, and I shouldn't be so harsh on the banks. I replied back to Bob. I appreciate his comment, but I'll I'll kind of recap. What I was saying was sometimes we do things emotionally that may not be the best financial choice. Some people may be able to self-insure for long-term care insurance, but they go ahead and buy the long-term care policy just because they like that peace of mind. Now, the example that I gave personally was my mortgage company got bought out. My loan was bought out by Wells Fargo, and I immediately went and refinanced because of how much I dislike Wells Fargo, and I didn't want Wells Fargo to make a penny off of me if I could avoid it. Now, it cost me money. Of course, I had closing costs and refinance costs. So financially speaking, this was not a very good decision on my part, but emotionally, it made me feel fantastic because I don't have to call myself a customer of Wells Fargo. Now, why Wells Fargo? Why do I not like Bank of America or Wells Fargo? Well, Google, you kind of do your own research. Wells Fargo and Bank of America both have unfair trade practices, not only to veterans, they were charging excess fees that were not disclosed to a bunch of veterans and VA loans, and they settled for hundreds of millions of dollars. They were ripping off veterans in this country on VA loans, admitted it, and settled. And then for years, Bank of America and Wells Fargo were ripping minorities off by charging them higher interest rates than they would charge a Caucasian with the same financial situation. And with a last name of Gonzalez and having many veterans in my family, I don't want to be a customer of Wells Fargo or Bank of America. I think they're despicable banks. But Bob, I appreciate your email. I'm not calling your kids ugly or anything like that. I think there are some terrific people that work for both banks. I'm not calling those people bad. I'm calling the bank's business practices unfair and unethical. So that's the chip on my shoulder about Bank of America and Wells Fargo. I'm never going to be a customer of theirs. Now, Bob, I mean, I can take it one step further and say, okay, if my financial advisor is at Bank of America Merrill Lynch or is at Wells Fargo, well, guess what? Those banks impose sales quotas on those advisors, meaning if they don't hit their sales quotas every month, they lose their job. But Bob, I appreciate your comment. Because I am not saying that financial advisors at Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo are bad financial advisors. I'm just pointing out that they have unethical business practices like these sales quotas that are not in their client's best interest. So if your retirement planner works for Bank of America or Merrill Lynch, and they're suggesting or recommending an investment whatever it happens to be, you might think to yourself, is this really in my best interest or is this going to help this person meet their sales quota for the month? Or at least that's what I would be thinking. But Bob, again, thank you for your question. Thanks for listening. It sounds like I ruffled some feathers and that was not my intention. I don't think the people that work for Bank of America or Merrill Lynch are bad people because I know that they're probably the ones that are not making the rules that they have to follow. So I hope that clears things up, Bob. Thank you for your question. The next question came up in a conversation with a client that had rental properties, right? Residential rental properties. And talking about the taxation of these. And for those that aren't familiar with how rental properties work, one of the advantages, if you own a a rental property, let's just call it a two-bedroom flat or something like that that you rent out. This is residential here that I'm talking about. You can... As the the owner of this rental property, you can depreciate the property over 27 and a half years. What do I mean by that? Well, it essentially reduces the amount of rent, rental income that's taxable because you're depreciating the property itself. Now, what happens when you go to sell that rental property? Guess what? Well, there's depreciation recapture, which means, hey, all of that depreciation is going to come back at you. So you're not just going to have a a capital gain based on what you bought it for and what you sold it for. 
that depreciation recapture will impact your tax situation as well. This particular couple just kind of wanted to be done with rental properties. They wanted to retire and move closer to their kids and grandkids. And I get it. Who wouldn't want to go to North Carolina? And then as far as selling their house for a couple, as long as you have lived in your primary residence two of full time, two of the last five years, there's a $500,000 capital gain exclusion. What does that mean? Well, let's say this couple lives in their house for 10 years, they bought it for 200,000, they sell it for 700,000, that's a $500,000 gain. Guess what? They don't have to pay taxes on any of that $500,000 gain because they had lived in the house as a primary residence two of the last five years. What does that mean? Well, if they sold it for anything above a $500,000 gain, yes, then the incremental amount over that $500,000 gain would be subject to capital gain taxes. Another question that was emailed in was where a guy was going to be retiring at the end of 2022. In his plan, he had a, a million dollar gain in his company stock. He had worked for the same company his entire career. And his plan was to have no taxable income in 2023. Therefore, he would be in the 0% tax bracket with no income. And his brother told him if he's in the 0, 10, or 12% tax bracket and you have any capital gain, well, you pay 0% taxes on that capital gain. So his entire million dollar capital gain of that stock would not be taxed at all. There would be zero capital gains on that. And I'm not going to argue with his brother on this, but unfortunately, that's not correct. A portion of that million dollar capital gain will be taxed. There will be a portion that's taxed at the 0% long-term capital gain rate. But I mean, just think about that. Conceptually, if someone had a capital gain, long-term capital gain of $5 million, and they had no other earned income, they're going to pay 0% taxes on that $5 million of gains? That's just not how our tax system works, unfortunately. So what I would recommend that this listener do is contact your local CPA or, or tax advisor and ask them, what of this entire million dollar gain of stock, how much can I sell to pay 0% long-term capital gains, given the fact that I have no other earned income in 2023? And instead of selling the stock all at once, I would sell it in stages and bunches, maybe on an annual basis, so my long-term capital gain was as low as possible. And this is another mistake that I see people make over and over again, is they think in terms of all or nothing. They think, I've got to sell my entire portion of my mutual fund, or I have to sell all of my stock. You can always sell a portion of it now, and then a portion of it later when it may make more sense. Maybe the stock has done really, really well, and you want to kind of take some profits off the table and further diversify by selling a portion. That's okay, you can do that but you don't have to sell all of it if you don't want to. And like I said, it may even help you from a tax standpoint to only sell a portion at a time. Just something to consider. You know where to find me, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com at the bottom. You know, you can submit your questions if, if you have any follow-up questions. And I did have two questions that were submitted through the website there. One was from Beth, and Beth was talking about her financial advisor and also her tax advisor, what I'm going to call a tax advisor. And her concern was, without reading word for word, her concern was that her tax advisor, her CPA, just did tax prep and did not do what, what she's calling tax planning. And she was very, very frustrated with that because he seemed to be very, very busy come tax time and he sent like a list, like a checklist of things that every year that, that she can check the boxes and, and throw her 1099s and W-2s and all this kind of stuff in an envelope and then deliver that to his office and he would prepare the tax return. But she said she was looking for so much more and she wanted to know if this even existed. And then she also said that she had a stockbroker from Stiefel Nicholas, which is, it's a big firm here in St. Louis. Many of you, many of the listeners may not be familiar with it, but he was very into stock trading. And every time Beth goes to visit with him, he recommends buying and selling certain individual stocks and bonds. 
And she asked him kind of point blank about her retirement plan. And he kind of changed the subject and and went back to the investments. So my thinking, Beth, is that your stockbroker, that's his specialty. His specialty is focusing on the investments. Just like your tax advisor, or it's really a tax preparer, they are trying to prepare as many tax returns as they can and get you in and out kind of thing. And they work on a volume business, kind of like H&R Block or some of those companies. So to answer Beth's question, it's just you're working with the wrong providers. A stockbroker is not going to have a specialty in retirement planning. His specialty is in analyzing stocks and bonds. And then your tax preparer is just doing that, preparing taxes which is really taking the information from your 1099s and W-2s that you're providing and typing them into the software, the tax planning or the tax prep software, and then it prints out a, an outcome and then you sign and you submit your taxes. That's what they do. So it sounds more like you're looking for a tax planner and a retirement planner, somebody who specializes in retirement planning. So that's who you need to seek out. And I hear this from people all the time. They may have an old financial advisor or stockbroker, and they may say, oh, we're working with Hal. And Hal is a great guy. He even goes to the same church as we do. And we just hate to leave him, but he just doesn't provide the tax planning and retirement planning that we're looking for at this crucial moment in our lives. So when you're hiring an advisor, whether it's a tax advisor, financial advisor, whoever it is, I've said this on multiple podcasts, find someone that ha- that specializes in what you're looking for help with. Maybe it's a, an, an attorney. Maybe you're looking for estate planning help. If that's the case, I would recommend seeking out an attorney who specializes in estate planning and makes that the sole focus of their business because there are attorneys out there that just focus on estate planning. There's other attorneys that just focus on personal injury. And if you're looking for a personal injury attorney, well, you're not going to call your estate planning attorney and vice versa. A personal injury attorney legally could draft a will and a trust and all that stuff, but I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in that person just because that's not their specialty. It's the same with a doctor. My doctor, my general practitioner, he always refers me out to these specialists if I ever need them whether it's a dermatologist or something like that, or if I'm getting x-rays or an MRI, well, I went to a radiologist. So good question, Beth. I know I I elaborated on your, your question way, way too much, but hopefully you can find some specialists that can help you. And then the last question that was submitted from the website was from Tim. And Tim wanted to know about the changes for 2023. Tim says that he is 63 years old and wants to max out his Roth IRA and his 401k next year, did the limits increase? Pretty straightforward question. And yes, they did, Tim. Roth IRAs went up to $7,500 for somebody over 50. You can contribute up to $7,500 for each spouse if you're married. And keep in mind, there are income limits to that, so be aware of those. And then for your 401k, Tim, that actually went up three grand. So in 2022, if you were over 50, you could contribute $27,000 a year to your 401k. But in 2023, because inflation has been so high, they adjusted all the tax tables and they allow us now to contribute $30,000 a year in 2023 to your 401k since Tim is over 50. So you do the math, Tim will be able to contribute 30 grand to his 401k and then another 7500 to his Roth IRA. So that's $37,500 that Tim can save for retirement in 2023. So Tim, I hope that helps you. Again, 30,000 to your 401k, $7500 to your Roth IRA for a total of $37,500. If you save that for retirement next year, Tim, you are an all-star. So good luck. I hope you can do that. That's all I got for this episode of the Retirement Made Easy podcast. If you have questions or you're interested in that 30-minute retirement coaching call, visit my website, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. I'll see you next week. And remember, always dream big.
The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, please consult your attorney, tax advisor, or financial advisor prior to investing. This is a hypothetical example and is not representative of any specific investment. Your results may vary. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices mentioned are are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. The Smart Investor Program is a directory of investment professionals. Neither Dave Ramsey nor Smart Investor are affiliates of St. Louis Retirement Advisors or LPL Financial. There is no guarantee that a diversified portfolio will enhance overall returns or outperform a non-diversified portfolio. Diversification does not protect against market risk. All investing involves risk, including loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, Memra FINRA, SIPC. Thank you for listening to the show today. Check us out at our website, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. And if you want some help from Greg, submit your questions at the bottom of the page or sign up for a 30-minute retirement coaching session with Greg. We'll see you next week.